Amen. How many are hungry for God's word today? Yeah. Praise God. Amen. Let's open up the word to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Today, as we are continuing this series, Here Comes Heaven, the promise of a Savior. Last week, if you recall, if you were with us, um, we talked about, um, we were talking about the kingdom of heaven and how that we've been given the keys to the kingdom. And we're also to declare, and I'm going to share with you one of the keys here today, is the key of understanding and revelation of the word but, but also that we're to declare heaven. In other words, Jesus said, you know, when you approach God in prayer, pray these words, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And so in essence, it's translated kingdom of heaven come. Come into my house, come into my situation. Uh, come and operate in my life as it is in heaven. And so today as we approach this chapter, Matthew 13, Jesus is teaching about the purpose of his teachings, his parables. And so I'm calling this chapter, The Kingdom of Heaven is Like. The Kingdom of Heaven is Like. And we're going to break it down a little bit here today. And so go with me to Matthew chapter 13. I have the Passion Translation up here on the screen that I'm reading from, but, you, but I'll be reading from other versions here in a moment as well. It says in Matthew 13, 10, it says... Then his disciples approached Jesus and asked, Why do you always speak to people in these hard-to-understand parables? And he explained, You've been given the intimate experience, or it has been given to you, the intimate experience of insight into into the hidden mysteries of the realm of heaven's kingdom, but they have not. Who are they? They who have not believed. But they have not. For everyone who listens with an open heart will receive progressively more revelation until he has more than enough. But those who don't listen with an open, teachable heart, even the understanding that they think they have will be taken from them. That's why I teach the people using parables, because they think they're looking for truth, yet because their hearts are unteachable, they never discover it. Although they will listen to me, they never fully perceive the message I speak. The prophecy of Isaiah describes them perfectly. Although they listen carefully to everything I speak, they don't understand a thing I say. They look and pretend to see, but the eyes of their heart are closed. Their minds are dull and slow to perceive. Their ears are plugged and hard of hearing. And they have deliberately shut their eyes to the truth. Otherwise, they would open their eyes and see, and open their ears to hear, and open their minds to understand. Then they would turn to me, and I will instantly heal them. But blissful are your eyes, for they, delighted are your eyes, for they are open to hear all the things, all the things many prophets and godly people yearn to see these days of miracles that you've been in favor to see. They would have been given every they would have given everything to hear the revelation you've been favored to hear. Amen. Would you pray with me for a moment as we dive into this word today? Lord, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you invite us to come and see, to come and hear, to come and receive, to receive the good news, to receive salvation. Dear Lord, even what we are seeing and what we are witnessing for, the prophets of old would have given anything to see our day. And so we live in very precious and privileged times. And like Paul prayed the prayer in the book of Ephesians, Lord, give us eyes that see, give us ears that hear, and give us a teachable heart. Give us a heart that is open to receive your word like fertile ground, ground that has been ground that has been cultivated and plowed and receptive to your word today in Jesus' name. And in it, dear God, may we bear great fruit in the name of Jesus. And everyone says, Amen. 
Amen. Jesus said in the book of John 15 that we would bear fruit that remains. Amen? Not just here today and gone tomorrow, but fruit that lasts. And so I'm excited about this word because in this word, um, we're going to talk about in the, in the parable that Jesus is sharing in this, in this particular chapter, he is saying the kingdom of God is like. In fact, it, there's other chapters. In fact, Luke chapter thir- or Matthew 13 is most of the parables that Jesus shares. And there's one more chapter, I believe it's in John or Luke, that shares a few more parables, but we're going to focus on this one in particular. And it's primarily talking about the good seed, the seed and the sower, wheat and tare. And we're going to talk about the dragnet at the end. And so when you think about this, um, when it comes to the kingdom of God, only believers have access into the kingdom of God. Only believers. Only people who have, who have said yes in faith. The only currency that God operates in is faith. He doesn't operate in works. He doesn't operate in traditions. He doesn't operate in, uh, you, know, our, you know, the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the way thereof is death. He, he, you know, this gospel is not a man-made gospel. This gospel, this word, this good news comes straight from heaven. Amen? The kingdom of heaven is like. It's where God takes a heavenly principle and, and, and describes it to us in earthly terms. But this book is eternal. This book is the most valuable uh, gift we have from God because it carries, it carries the promise of our salvation. It carries the promise of healing. It carries the promise of uh, being broken off, the chains being broken off, addictions being broken off, fear being broken off, doubts and lies of the enemy being broken off. That's what this word is. This word is good seed. There's no other seed like this word. And the thing about this word is this, is that this particular seed, that no matter where it's planted, whether it grows or not in that place where it's planted, does not disqualify the seed. It doesn't change the fact that God's word is true. Just because our culture says otherwise or people around us have come up with their own gospel per se uh, to explain the gaps in their understanding when it comes to what is my purpose, what is my value, why am I here, why is, is this as good as it gets? And for the lack of knowledge, the lack of the word, people often fill in the blanks for themselves. But it does not change this word. Is, as it says of itself, it is the same yesterday God's word, today and forever. Not one cross T or dotted I will ever pass away until all of it comes to pass. And even then, it still will stand for eternity. Amen? And so we've been given something so precious. In fact, I encourage you, I I find more and more often when I ask the question, do you have a Bible? More and more people say, no, I don't. I know we have apps. I can appreciate that. I use one. But there's nothing like buying yourself or getting yourself a physical copy of the Word of God. Uh, to open it daily, to, to read its pages, to, to, to say, Holy Spirit, help me to understand. Help me to listen. Help me to comprehend. Show me what is God's will in heaven on earth. What is his promises for me that derive and are born in heaven and now want to be given birth in my life? Uh, this is what, this, again, this, this is not like any other book. I had a missionary professor, I should say, back in college that he would often go to foreign countries. Um, he was a missionary to South America, and then he had the opportunity to go to many other countries, and he would bring Bibles with him. And uh, at that time, Russia was closed off to the gospel at large, and, and uh, he, had a, he had some Bibles in his suitcase. And, of course, they had to go through inspection and uh, they opened up the Bible, and this one Russian guard said, uh, you, you, know, you can't take that book with you. And the missionary acted somewhat kind of you know, ignorant, saying, well, what's the big deal? What's the problem? And, and the Russian guard said, that book is like no other book. 
that book changes lives. That book is different than any other book on the earth. Amen? And so we as believers, and I, and I hope that this is instilled in your heart today, that this word from beginning to end is infallible. That it, it, is, it, is, it, it has been disputed for thousands of years, but it remains the same. It's been through the fire, as the word says, seven times over and remains pure as gold. Amen? And so this is the most precious gift you have from God. And when you receive it, because only, the only way to enter into heaven, the only way to experience the kingdom of heaven is by faith. We have access by faith. Uh, in fact, Jesus said it in verse 11, it has been given to you who, you who believe. You who believe. In 1 first, in first Corinthians 1, it says it this way in verse 20. It says, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. In other words, man's truth versus God did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. To the world, this is foolishness. Paul says it this way, though, in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of this gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. It is, it is the only word I've ever heard or received or experienced that actually has set me free, that actually has, has, has cleansed my conscience from my past. I no longer have a rap sheet. I no longer have fear or condemnation. I'm no longer worried about what does the future hold or is the hammer going to drop some, at some point somewhere? Am I going, is it going to catch up with me? But when God looks at you through Jesus Christ, he, sa- he sees nothing but Jesus. In fact, when he looks at you, he's like, you may bring up something and he'll say, I'm sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. Because he says, I've already forgotten that. I've chosen to forgive and to forget. How many of you can praise God that God has a bad memory when it comes to past sin? Amen? When we ask for forgiveness, God forgets it. God sets us free from it. There's no condemnation, no fear of future judgment for it. But it's to those who believe. It's to those who say yes, say, to say, Lord, I give up. I can't do this. My life is a wreck. I've done, it. I've done it my way for far too long, and I cannot do it one more moment. I need a rescuer. I need a savior. I believe in Jesus, the only begotten son. And so it's given to us who believe, but not just to us who believe, but he goes on to say, and to know. In other words, only believers can understand the kingdom of heaven. Only believers understand the mysteries of the word of God. In verse 11, it goes on to say, it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. In other words, that it's like the blind man. He was age 42. He was in the temple. Jesus walks in, and the word says he, he prayed over him. His eyes popped open. And he went around declaring, I can see. The religious people kept coming to him and saying, who healed you? What was his name? And what day of the week did he do it on? They were worried about the rules and regulations. They did not celebrate the fact that this man was seeing for the first time in his life. All they were worried about was, did you obey the rules when you did it? In the kingdom of God, there is only one law, and that is the law of faith. And there's nothing against faith in God. Amen? And they asked him so many times. They said, you know, they said, who did it? What day did he do it on? What was his name? He finally said, do you want to know him as well? And they said, of course not. We're getting to heaven because of our own righteousness. And he said, all I know is this. I was once blind, but now I can see. That's all I know. I was once blind, but that's all. But now I can see. There's no equation. We're not going to be able to figure out the, the, the equation for our salvation. All we know is God says, receive my son and believe and you shall be saved. Amen? Receive his sacrifice. And so because of it, the word says he gives us the knowledge or understanding of the kingdom of God. The word says in John 12, 16, his disciples Think about this. His disciples did not understand the things at first. 
But it goes on to say, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered these things that were written about him, that they had done, that he had done these things to him. In other words, that after he rose again, the word says he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. They were experiencing a born-again experience. And in that moment, they began to understand the scriptures. They began to realize, aha. How many remember your first aha? Your aha moment. You know, when you went to pick up this book again, you tried reading it before, but it didn't make sense. And, and it just looked like a lot of scary fire and brimstone coming down all the time. And it's like, what, where, what is this about? But then when you open it up again with new eyes and new ears and a new heart, then all of a sudden when you begin to read it, you begin to, God the Holy Spirit's right there with you, your teacher, your comforter, the revealer, the convictor. He's saying, hey, this is what I intended when I wrote these scriptures about who? Jesus. Jesus. And so the word tells us that, that they are not naturally discerned but by the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.13, well, 2.14 says, The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness to him, nor can they know them because they are spiritually discerned. That's why Paul says in the book of Ephesians, he said, I pray that God, God gives you eyes that see and ears that hear. Jesus had told the disciples, he says, when I'm preaching to these Pharisees and these religious people, he says, the prophecy is fulfilled. They see, but they don't see. They hear, but they don't hear. They, they, they act like they know, but they really don't know. Why? Because they have not acknowledged the Son of God. They have not acknowledged their sin. They're relying on the rules and regulations and, 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 and relying on fulfilling the Ten Commandments in and of their own ability. But how many of you know that we cannot, that the commandments of God point us to Jesus who is the fulfillment of all the law. And when we put our faith and trust in him, he's taken care of the law for us. He has fulfilled it for us, in us, and through us. Amen? He is that fulfillment, and he will live it out in our lives. And so that's why Jesus continues to say in this chapter, two times he says, so he that has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, if... Have you ever had your mama tell you, you got two ears, now use them? Have you ever heard that? Well, God is saying, if you've got spiritual ears to hear, use them. Listen. Listen to what the word says. But this is what I, so that's just a little bit of foundation for you, that, that we have a word that we as believers can, can put our trust in, but also to know and to understand Why? It's in order that we may, as the word says, help expand the kingdom of heaven. Jesus tells us everywhere we go, let people know the kingdom of heaven has come near you. The kingdom of heaven has come near you. He told the disciples when he sent them out, he says, when you sit at the dinner table of a non-believing family, pray for the sick and let them know that the kingdom of God has come near them. Amen? Around your Thanksgiving table, maybe you had a moment if you have a testimony, I'd love to hear about it later. But maybe you had a moment where someone was more, more interested in praying for something personal than they were over the Thanksgiving dinner. Maybe there was a moment around between two off to the side or maybe around that dinner table where you realize somebody needs a miracle today. Someone needs a breakthrough today. Someone needs to meet Jesus today. And it's not just good for Thanksgiving, but it's good every time of the year like the writer said in Luke 2, it's for everyone, everywhere. Amen? And so we are given the kingdom, not just that we're invited to join the kingdom, but we're to bring the kingdom of God in the earth. And how do we do that? We do it with the good seed, the word. The thing is, the world does not need our opinions about God doesn't need our opinions about the purpose of life. doesn't need, you know, our take on or our spin on our truth per se, which is a popular phrase used these days. Because what they truly need is this. They need to hear what does God say. Uh, his truth is the only truth. It's the ultimate truth. 
when we stand before him, it says in the book of Luke, when we stand before him, we will be judged according to this. Not according to what Aunt Jenny said one day, you know, or what Uncle Tom said or what some cousin said to us or even what a preacher said, but ultimately what his word says. And so this being good seed, he gives us this story, and I'm going to read it real quickly in Matthew 13, verse 1. It says, In the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and a great multitude were gathered together to him, so that he got into the boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. These were hungry people. These were individuals that wanted to know. And the word says, Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed the seed, some fell by the wayside or hard ground, and the birds came and devoured it. Some fell, by, uh, fell on stony, stony places where, uh, where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth in the earth. But when the sun came up, they were scorched because they had no root, and they withered away. And some among thorns, and th the thorns sprang up and choked them out, and others fell on the ground, on the good ground, and yielded a crop, some having hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold. And then he says it, says it here, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. We've been given what the Bible calls a good seed. I got a seed here in my pocket somewhere. Pumpkin seed. We've come through pumpkin season, so there's a lot of seeds around, right? But we have been given a seed to sow. I've said it earlier that no matter where we sow it, and no matter whether it grows or not, it doesn't change the quality of the seed. We need to remember that. When you get rejected, you need to remember it doesn't change the good news. When you get the door slammed in your face, it doesn't change the quality of the, of the word of God. When you get told or mocked that you're, that you're a fool, that you're a liar, uh, that you're crazy, it does not change the quality or the promise of the word of God. And so the word tells us that we're to, and so back in those days, the word tells us to, to spread the... We read this chapter a lot and we think about ourselves, but I want you to think about the sower. You, in this, in this context, you're the sower. And you have good seed. And he says, in essence, everywhere you go, he wants you to spread the seed. Back in the days of Israel, when you know, we think of those planting crops that they'll plant a seed and cover it, plant it, cover it. Back in those days, they would just scatter the seed like this. Just scatter. I apologize, Betsy. I'll clean it up later. <laughs> Disclaimer. Betsy's like, oh, my goodness. What am I going to do? But in those days, they would just take the seed and throw it. And wherever it landed, close your eyes, put your goggles on. It's going to get worse. And wherever it landed, it would take root. The word says that some fell, on stone, some fell on hard ground. In other words, it just laid there. It just laid there. And what happens when it lays there? The word says that later on in the chapter, the birds come along and they take it and take it away. People who don't understand. People who are hardened. Does that mean they're always going to be hardened? No. That's why our job is, we're not, Peter or Paul said it this way, some plant, some water, but who gives the increase? God. So what do we do? We just cast seed. Everywhere we go, on the workplace, on our job, in our homes. Here, Mike, you need some seed. I need more than that, I think. Okay, here's some more. But most of it's for me. Okay. <laughs> freely you have received, so freely give. Every time you open up your word when you have a devotion or when you're part of a Zoom call, Elaine wants some seed. Every time you 
Oopsie daisy. I didn't do that, Betsy. That's someone else's drink. But every time you, every time you open up your word, you are discovering more seed. He says, whether it's hard ground, stony, stony is where the word says it did not, it did not take root, and when the sun came up, it burned off. In other words, when hard times come, how many of you know people that declared Jesus one day, but when it got hard, you couldn't find them? You're like, where did, where did Johnny go? Where did Steve go? Where did, where did these people go? They, they, were, they were in church last week, or they were, you know, they were at the prayer meetings. We, you know, they're here, but something has happened, and now we don't see them. What is it? I'm not judging anybody. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is this, is that it doesn't change the seed. Our job is to spread the seed. Our job is to, is to make sure that the gospel is being preached. And so you have hard ground, stony ground, thorny ground. The word says there later on in the chapter, Jesus said, it's when the cares of life choke out that seed. Do we stop casting seed because it's being choked out? Do we stop preaching the gospel because it seems to be a hard place? I remember a, a story I read early on in my min in ministry uh, about a man named Victor Plymeyer who was a who was a missionary to Tibet, and the story is told that it was 13 years before he saw one person come to Jesus. One person. In the meantime, it was within the first couple years of his life, of his time there that his son and his daughter, or his wife and his son died of a disease that they had gotten there in Tibet. And because they're so far from America, the Tibetans said, well, we will give you a plot of land so that you can bury your dead. Well, what happened was, because it was against the law to sell property to any Christian or non, you know, any religious group other than the religion of Tibet, they, were, they sold it unto him for burying his dead. What did he do? He built a church on the plot over the grave of his son and daughter. He was willing to go and die in Tibet if it meant in the future Tibet would bear fruit. If it meant in the future that Tibet would come to know Jesus. Even if those seeds seemed to be dormant for a while, yet he trusted that the seed, the good news of Jesus, would begin to grow. And he saw many believers come as the, as the, as the years passed by. And so when we, so we as believers, we are, this is our job. This is our commission. We're not only to receive the kingdom, but we're to, as the word says, you who have freely received, freely give. Amen? And so you've got the hard ground, you've got the stony ground, you've got the, you've got the thorny ground, and then you've got the fertile ground. I'm here to tell you, Richard, when you go back on your job tomorrow, there are people there that are, with, that are ready to receive seed. They're saying, hey, I know Richard. He's that guy that goes to church. He's that guy that talks about Jesus all the time. He's that guy that loves Jesus. His wife loves Jesus. His kids love Jesus. They seem to have peace. He's facing the same stuff I'm facing. What has he got? Jesus said, don't, he said to the disciples one time, he says, don't, see, the enemy will tell us it's a hard place. The enemy will say, oh, no, don't cast your seed that way. It's a thorny place. They'll just, they'll hear it, but they'll walk away, and it won't, it won't it'll be over. Or that's a, a, a stony place that when times get tough, that, you know, the sun will come out, it'll scorch. You know, it's not, I don't want to waste my seed, I'm here to tell you, you are never wasting seed when you cast that seed. You are never wasting the seed. You are never. The enemy will tell you, don't do it, it's too hard. Don't do it, it's thorny, it's stony. We are not the judge of the ground. Only God knows who has an open heart. I remember one time at, uh, as you know, for years we've been taking students to Mardi Gras every year to, to go witnessing and 
Our chancellor at that time, or he's still our chancellor, but the chancellor walked up to a kid that he's seen. He let 100 people just walk on by looking, looking for the one person that might be a good person to talk to, to witness to. And he walked up to the kid and says, hey, son, what are you doing? And the kid says, well, I'm waiting. I'm just waiting on God, just waiting for that one person to walk by that God's going to show me. Because he had just seen that kid walk up to someone and just get shut down. And the kid's walking away with his tail between his legs, and he walks up to him and says, what's happening? He's like, I was just waiting on God, waiting for the right person. And the chancellor said to him, he said, listen, son, everybody is lost. Everybody needs to hear the good news. Every, you cast your seed to everybody, anybody that walks by. We're not, the, we're not the judge of the seed. We're not the judge of the recipient. God is the one who brings the increase. He is the one who brings the increase. And so we've got to trust him with it. There will be, as the word talks about, tares or weeds in the, in the field, so many, some years ago, I went to, out to one of the wheat farmers out here toward Hepner, and um, he was talking to me about his harvest and, and just that how he had just went through his whole field and probably had about two or three dump truck loads of, I don't know what they call them now, but in the Bible it calls them tares. And in other words, they look like grain, but they're not grain. They look like wheat, but they're not wheat. And... And so I went out to his place one day, and I said, show me. I want to see this. And so he took me out into a field, and, and from a distance, it all looks the same. But when you come up on the field and you start walking through the wheat stalks, you'll see these ones that look like wheat but are not wheat. And he says, this is what you do, Terry. You take it carefully, pull it up by its root, and you twist it, and you tie it, and you put it carefully in a bag so that none of the seeds of that tear fall on the ground. And he says, I did this with about two or three truckloads back earlier in the season. And so there will be those who look like a Christian, talk like a Christian, act like a Christian, but are not a Christian. They don't have a, we could say it of any of us, we could look like it, talk like it, but not have intimacy with Jesus. But the Bible says that in the end, that God will separate the tear from the wheat. We pray that nobody is a tear. We pray that everybody is like wheat, that we're all going to be welcomed into the kingdom of God. But again, that should not stop us. You know, just because, you know, the world wants to say, well, the church is full of hypocrites. So is the world. <laughs> Everywhere you go. You're going to find people who are say one thing but do something else. But that is still no reason to hold back the seed. Jesus even said it in here, to those who use their seed, I'll give you more. Right, Jacob? You need some more seed. That's a revelation right there. Yes, you can give it away. That's a revelation. Just one seed is a revelation of Jesus. He says, the things I show you in secret, I want, I want you to share it from the rooftops. In other words, when we come out of our time of devotion, our pockets should be, thank you, Betsy. I needed some seed. <laughs> Every time we come out of the prayer closet, we should, our pockets should be spilling with seed. Everywhere we go, when we go to work tomorrow, we don't even know it, but we're dropping seed. We don't even realize it, but the presence of God is lingering everywhere we go. Did I drop something? Yes. More seed. We have to, if we're going to see God's kingdom grow, it's going to take the gospel. It's going to take seed. It's going to, but it, more than that, I heard, I heard Reinhard Bunke, one of my heroes of the faith, he said an unpreached gospel is no gospel at all. You could, have your, you could have your pockets full of seed, full of the word of God, but if you're never dropping any, if you're never displaying any, if you're not ever sharing any, it is 
unpreached gospel, therefore it will not impact anyone. If you must, use words. Oh, but pastor, I'm just going to let my life alone speak. Yes, your life does speak, but there's a time where you got to ask the question, do you know Jesus? Do you want to know what the change has been in my life? Do you want to know how I went from sorrow, despair, agony, hopelessness, brokenness, confusion, desperation? Do you want to know why I'm no longer that way? It's because of the good news of Jesus. Amen? Amen? I'll give one more parable. Back verse 47. The word says that the gospel is like a dragnet casting our nets. It's a seed, and it's also a net. The first time Jesus met Peter, Peter was on a boat fishing. He'd been fishing all night. And the word says that he was tired, he wanted to go home. And this teacher on the shore said, why don't you cast your net on the other side? We're only talking like six or seven feet, maybe ten. And Peter's thinking, what are you talking about? I've already, I'm ready to go home now. I'm ready to pack it in. I've already fixed my nets. We're ready to go home. Jesus said, do it one more time, but do it on the other side. And the word says that when Peter threw his net on the other side, that all of a sudden there was a jerk on that side of the boat. It, the boat began to tip as the nets were being filled to overflowing. And the word says that immediately Peter, in essence, fell on his face, humbled himself and said, I am not worthy to be here at this moment because I realize that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he told Peter, he said, Peter, you may be, you may have, maybe fish is what you know, but I'm going to make you fishers of men. And then it was even at the end when Jesus had died and rose again, the Bible says that Peter decided to go back to his old profession. How many, how many have thought to yourself, I'm just going to go back to what I know. And the word says that this voice from the shoreline said, Peter, cast your net to the other side. And the word says, again, he cast his net and the boat began to tip. He even is asking for other fishermen to come along and help. And the word says that Peter then jumped in the water and swam to the shore. He didn't have to worry about uh, who is this. He knew who it was. He had seen this miracle before. And so to us, he's saying, you know what? Cast your seed. Cast the net. Doesn't matter what kind of fish you get, your job is to cast the net. Doesn't matter what, you know, you know, what time of day it is. Maybe you've been, maybe you've been laboring all night. Maybe you've been working. Maybe you just aren't, maybe it's, you're not, that's not your vibe at that moment. But Jesus says, I want you to cast it one more time. Because there's someone that I have, there's someone I've been dealing with that's looking for good news, looking to know Jesus. Amen? And so he says, I want you to, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that pulls in a harvest. And so the last scripture of this chapter, verse 52, it says every scholar of the scripture, in other words, every believer, every one that's hungry for this word, who is instructed in the ways of the kingdom of heaven realm, is like a wealthy homeowner and with his house filled with treasure, both new and old. What is God saying there? Or what is Jesus saying there? He's saying, you know, as a believer who's faithful with the seed, as a believer who's faithful with the net, he says, I'm going to give you the words you need You'll know what tool to pull out of your bag. You'll know what scripture per se to administer or to share with someone who is in need of salvation. He says, you're going to have a wealth. If you're going to use it, I'm going to give you more. If you give away the revelation I've given you of me already, I'm going to give you more. And you'll know which one to share at the right time. Jesus told the disciples, he said, don't be afraid when they call you before the magistrate or the court to give a testimony for your faith. Because God the Holy Spirit will put the words on your mouth. That's good seed. That's good news. He'll tell you, okay, it's time to cast. It's time to pull the net in. Souls are coming. Amen? 
Can we believe God for that zeal? Souls are coming. We are dropping seed all over Hermiston, dropping seed in every neighborhood, casting net on every seashore or every bank, casting net saying, God, I don't know what's under those waters, but I'm going to cast the net. I'm going to be faithful to the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Will you stand with me this morning? Some plant, some water, but God gives the increase. God gives the increase. If you're here this morning and you have not at this point received that seed, maybe in the past someone tried to share it with you and you're like, you know what, I don't want to hear about it. Or maybe it was... Stony. Initially, you received it, but when hard times came, you went. You just kind of went back to what you've always done. Oftentimes, when people receive the gospel, and there's some well-known people we know out there, you know, that, that that we see that are preachers and teachers today that admit that the first time they accepted Christ, they went back out and started doing the same stuff they always did. But then there came that moment where something took root. There came that moment where something came alive. There came a moment. Jesus said, the son of man is like the seed. Unless he first dies or goes to the ground and dies, can he come alive again? And at some point, Jesus would come alive in them. And they have begun to bear much fruit. I don't know what condition you're in. I don't know if you've been the hard ground up to this moment. Or the stony or the thorny. But today you're saying, you know what, I'm fertile ground. I need Jesus today. And if that's you here this morning and you want to receive Jesus in your heart, I want to give you an invitation to say yes to him. Amen. And so would you do this? We're going to celebrate. We always love. If you all don't know it yet, we love to have a party at Zeal. We love to celebrate when new people come into the kingdom. And if that's you here today and you're saying, yes, pastor, I, I want to know Jesus for myself, and if that's you, can you slip up a hand and say, that's me, and we want to pray with you? Yes, I see two hands, all out of my, three, four hands, yes. Yes. Anyone else? Anyone else? Keep those hands high. Anyone else? One in the middle, yes. Amen. 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 Would you do this with me? If you've raised your hand, maybe someone with you can come with you, but would you just join me right here in the front? And when you do, we're going to celebrate like the angels do. Amen? And we want to celebrate with you, and we're going to pray a prayer together. But let's celebrate as these come forward right now. Come on down. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Yes, there are more coming. Just stand right across the front. There you go. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Isn't this a precious sight? Isn't this beautiful? If, you, if there's more, we're going to make time for more. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. This is the most important decision of your life to receive Jesus, to receive the good news. He's going to produce fruit in you, life in you, joy in you, righteousness in you. The Bible says in Romans 14, 17, that the kingdom of God is righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so would you, would you pray this prayer with me, church? Let's pray along with those who've come forward. Maybe the prayer team can come and stand with some of them as well. But as we pray this prayer, let's all pray it together. Father God, thank you for sowing the seed of Jesus. That seed fell to the ground and it died and it rose again with newness of life. 
I receive that seed of Jesus Christ. And because he lives, I can live also. Forgive me. Make me new. I repent. I turn around. I turn away from the world and my sin. And I turn to you. I accept Jesus as my Savior from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Give him praise. Give him praise. Give him praise. As you stay with, just stay right here with us. We have, we have a Bible as a gift for you, but also just to connect with you as well. Don't leave until someone connects with you, if you will. But as we pray, as we pray here in closing together, and these are altars are going to be open, if you want to come and just spend some time before you leave this service today. But having received the good news, everyone here now is in the kingdom, right? We're all part of the kingdom, right? And the kingdom is like a sower with the seed. Every one of us, look at your neighbor and say, you're a sower. You're a planter. You have seed, valuable seed, priceless seed. You have good news. I want us to believe God to fill our pockets with the good seed. Amen? With the good news that everywhere we go, that it will spill over. Whether we mean to or not, that we be so full of Jesus, so full of the love of God, that seed will just pour out everywhere we go. Amen? And so I want you to lift your hands to the Lord this morning. I'm going to ask you to do something I haven't asked before. Just lift them high. It's an act of surrender. You're saying, Lord, yeah, pretend you're doing aerobics if you have to, if that's what makes you feel better. But, but raise your hands high and just say, Lord, I receive your commission. I receive. Lord, so I just declare this, dear God, over we as a church, over we as believers. God, we receive the seed. We've received it freely. And so, Lord, we freely give it. God, Lord, show us the good, the good, the mysteries of the word. Show, give us insight. When we go home and read this word again, dear God, may our hearts, dear God, burn within us, Lord. May our, may our spirit just rise with anticipation at the opportunity that we're going to spread some seed, that we're going to share the gospel, that we're going to let somebody know God loves them, God cares about them. God can heal them. God can save them. God can deliver them. God can give them hope through Jesus Christ. Lord, this is our prayer. If no one else, who, if no one else will do it, who will? Dear God, we're not, we're not looking to someone else to take care of it. Dear God, you have given us enough seed to see this city saved in Jesus' name. You've given us seed to see this city saved, Lord. In one day, 120 full of the seed of the gospel saw 3,000 saved in one day as they went out spreading the, the good news of Jesus. And so, Lord, we go out of this place carrying seed, not for ourselves, but rather for others. And to say, have you heard? Do you know? Can I tell you? I've got to share with you. My heart, I, I feel like it's fire shut up in my bones. I've got to tell somebody, anybody, everybody about the kingdom of heaven and who is the king, King Jesus. And so God, we just commit our hearts, we commit our lives. Dear God, we take up the great commission and we go and we spread the seed in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. If that's your heart's cry, can you give God a big shout, an amen, a clap, a dance? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Wow. Isn't God so good? Amen. And all the time, all the time, he is good. Amen. I pray you have the best week. Take risks. Be willing to drop some seed. Be willing to share what Jesus has done for you. No one can dispute your testimony. 
No one can change your mind on it. It happened. You're not the same person. And so when you share it, don't, don't be taken back if the ground is hard or thorny or, uh, or stony. All you're, all you're accountable for is to share the seed. Amen? Amen. Let's worship as we close this day. Amen.